we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tank. More specifically, it's Energy in America is what it is. We do this um, on Wednesday afternoons every couple of weeks with uh, Lou Pugliarisi, wherever he may be in the world. He happens to be in Tokyo right now. Welcome to the show, Lou. Good to be here, Jay. Nice sunny morning, 10 o'clock in the morning here in Tokyo on Thursday. All right. Well, that makes a five-hour difference. Then. It's at 3 o'clock <laughs> in the afternoon here in Honolulu. <laughs> So there's so many people in the world today, Lou, there's so much happening. I mean, one thing and another is like chock-a-block. And, um, you know, we could go on talking about all these things, but uh, we, <clears throat> we're we going to talk today about coronavirus, which is a really good topic, and uh, and how it is affecting or will affect um, energy pricing and the energy markets. Because after all, uh, as they say, things are uncertain in a time of coronavirus. What do you think? Yeah, first, I, I do think uh, we tend to under-appre- underappreciate the economic consequences. I mean, in a way, you could say there's some good news from this. It probably means that gasoline prices will be a bit lower in Honolulu. They might be a lot lower, actually. Mm. You may see a considerable drop, and we'll go through that a bit. And we have some data to look at to the comparison of SARS and uh, other sorts of uh, uh, breakout such as this, but this is a big deal. I know that this has been in the Hawaiian press and government authorities have been talking about this because um, it can have a rather devastating effect on travel. And you'll see that in, in some of the pictures we have here, but also, of course, in main tourist destinations such as uh, Hawaii. And um, I don't know what the data is showing. I know initially it doesn't look so bad, but uh, we're really seeing massive uh, shifts in air travel now. And you'll see how this shows up in a lot of different ways. It's quite amazing. Mm-hmm. And it's something that um, I really initially thought the administration was overreacting, was uh, being much too aggressive and uh, trying to shut down travel. But uh, there's some more recent data coming out that suggests this thing is a lot more serious than we had thought initially. And we'll talk a little bit about that first as a setup to this uh, to this problem. Yes. Well, you know, uh, we've done uh, oh three or four shows on coronavirus already, and we yeah. have the state uh, director of uh, infectious disease. We had yeah. the director of infectious disease at Queens Hospital on last week, and uh, we're going to have the director in the health department um, going on next week, um, actually Friday. And so, I mean, what's what's happening is that um, nobody is able to stop this. The isolation thing doesn't necessarily work. And so, what what you have is the the possibility of an unrestrained epidemic. And query: How long does that take to resolve itself? Yeah. So I think you know, there's you know, I'm a little outside my lane here talking about epidemiology, but the recent uh, research suggests that there was this there was this sense that you could be asymptomatic and it's show no symptoms and transmit the disease. I think the most recent uh, some of the most recent research and observations, let's say, among sort of professional uh, epidemiologists are indicating that no, that's not the case. Some people had very low level symptoms, but you do have to be symptomatic to transmit the disease. You do have to have droplets in the atmosphere. It, it, it's obviously a communicable disease. And uh, you, know, you, you will see that in some of, the, uh, some of the data here. But also you will see that uh, um, you, uh, the, it, is, it is still largely a Chinese problem. You know? But it can easily, given that it can easily, you know, uh, migrate to other parts of the world. Mm-hmm. So if we go to the first, uh, why don't we start with the with the travel alert now? Can you? Uh, the picture is frozen on my screen, but I don't know if you can see me okay or not. Yeah, we we're looking at uh, NCOV uh, health alert travelers. Okay, from- great. Let's look at that one for starters. Uh, so, you know, uh, I actually just have a personal story. My son came out of Nanjing about uh, uh, 10 days ago, 12 days ago, and met um, my wife and I in Honolulu for his holiday. He got out and into Hawaii, there was no checking. No one checked in. 
He's back home in Washington. He is, he's postponed his return to Nanjing, and he's completely uh, asymptomatic. But uh, during the time he was in Hawaii, the government began to ramp up uh, more controls and reviews. And you, you could just see, well, there's lots of people like him who came into the country who were under the net, if you like, before a lot of these controls had kicked into place. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, so I think that, you know, and I'm sure this is the advice your your experts have given you. Wash your hands. Uh, it's unclear how good these masks are unless you have a real uh, sophisticated mask. But do all the common sense things that you do for the flu. Uh, I do have a, a, he has a twin brother, actually, that works with big data in the healthcare field. And he was telling me he thought that uh, there was underreporting of the data and that the strain might be much more lethal because of the uh, underreporting in China. And if we go to the next slide, you can see it as a very traditional, the global spread of the coronavirus. And uh, you can see here, it has a very kind of traditional movement of a pandemic. It rises at a very rapid rate. By the way, uh, this is, as we say, jump change compared to measles apparently kills about 150,000 people a year. And we have a vaccine for that. But uh, I think the big concern about the coronavirus is we just don't know enough about it yet. We don't, you know, there could be, we could be misjudging these lethality. We may be too low, too high. And there was a report, there have been two or three reports that Tencent, the monster technology company in China, probably one of the biggest companies in the world, had been posting data that was contrary to the government statistics. And this data show the number of cases and the number of fatalities probably 10 times as high as the official data, but they quickly changed it. So I do think we're still entering uh, a period of time here where we don't have a good handle yet on the scale and scope of the disease. So this yeah, is uh, people who are uh, trying to make a vaccine, which would, you know, ameliorate the uh, the epidemic. Um, say that it's going to take at least a year to do that. So that's a big yes. Problem. And then if right. you and look at the uh, you know the nature of a of a virus like this, I think you know the unrestrained aspect of the vi of the virus is really simple. There are some people who only have a mild cold and they recover pretty quickly, but they're carriers. There are other people who are vulnerable and they don't recover so fast. And there are other people who are very vulnerable and they die. And it's a, right. a high percentage for this, I think. We don't know exactly what, what the... So, yeah, so the initial data on the folks I spoke to is that... Uh, so, and of course, a lot of this is the denominator, you know, uh, and uh, the way we collect data both in the U.S. and China, but I think health experts in the U.S. would say that the death rate from the flu, you know, it hits very young, very young children of babies and old and people that are already ill who are old. I mean, the death rate, but it's not. A, it's probably well below a half a percent now. Part of this is if you you've got to collect the right data on the denominator, and that. There, there is some data out there that suggests that while the deaths appear to be low, its lethality may be as much as 44 times higher than that of the flu in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And that within China, we're probably not getting a good measurement of everybody who's got it. And we may, so, so, so right now we, we may be overestimating its lethality because we're seeing the number of people dying, but there's probably a lot of people who, who had a mild case who are afraid to go to the hospital because they're going to get quarantined or locked up. So I, I do think this is very typical, the early stages of these kinds of problems. Um, we tend to probably underestimate its, uh, its lethality and its problem. On the other hand, the, the markets tend to overreact, at least in the beginning. And I think that's what we're seeing now in the oil market. Well, so let's talk about, go ahead, go ahead. We know, we know the uh, travel industry has taken a big hit already. Oh, huge, huge, huge. A lot of flights and tours have been canceled, especially those uh, dealing in and with China. 
Um, and, uh, you know, there, there's probably a lot of concern all over the world that slows business down. You know, optimism leads to, you know, more investment, more activity, and pessimism doesn't, the old story about markets. Um, and, I mean, I, I don't think it was, um, um, you know, uh, out of line for the market to drop 600 points uh, on one day last week. Um, and it's come up, it's come back since remarkably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I do think in I general, over time, it'll probably decline until this is resolved. But you know, the one lesson that might be good that comes out of this, which is, we are dealing, we don't benefit in the West if there's a major calamity in China. We uh, need China to be a prosperous country. Absolutely. Because there's over a billion people there. They're fantastic consumers, and it's not. And so this goes back to the issue of trade wars, whatever you want to say. Our relationship with China is not one in which we win if they decline dramatically. If they mm -hmm. decline dramatically, it's bad for all of us. Yes. And I think, actually, I'm almost sensing that the Trump administration has got that message. I mean, I think Trump has reached out to Xi on several occasions the U.S. is already shipping a lot of medical equipment and testing equipment into China. Uh, they've all, they've opened up CDC resources to China. So I, I actually think the Chinese are, you know, they do have all these characteristics of autocratic regimes and trying to hide gate and everything. But they're handling this a little much better than the SARS. I think we're learning a lot more a lot quicker than yeah. they did under SARS. <clears throat> There's plenty of criticism brewing, though, about how they kept it quiet for a month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. As I say, it's and the nature it, of autocratic regimes. Yeah. And, and well, the problem is that what they did before, which is now being criticized, leads to an undermining of their credibility. And so this is you know, very sensitive stuff. People are worried about life and death. Um, and if they don't believe the government because of what happened before, uh, that's really uh, that undermines the effort to resolve the crisis. And so uh, there have been a lot of um, articles and, and I've seen video interviews where Chinese people have spoken out against the government. And I, I, I really believe, though, Lou, I believe that the government is turning more candid. Uh, and, and the people have got to come along on that, including the Chinese people. Oh, I, I agree. I agree as well. And, you know, China is a big, a big piece of the world uh, oil market. If we go to the... The, uh, the question of Brent crude, pr crude oil price, which is the kind of most classically traded uh, uh, price of oil in the world market, gives a good sense of what the price of crude is world, across the whole world. You can see that by February 20th, the price of crude oil had dropped to $54 a barrel. Uh, this is largely, but not entirely, a massive drop in jet fuel demand. It's just uh, having a catastrophic effect on the uh, revenues in the oil industry, as well, of course, as uh, refineries and the whole uh, energy complex uh, within the world. And it's not really good for U.S. producers either, because we export a lot of oil and gas now. So well, if, an uh, is, if an economy is slowing down, <clears throat> people, there's a linkage, right, between a absolutely. economy and demand for fuel. So if it's slowing down, uh, then it's going to be a, a lower demand, and therefore, uh, you know, the uh, production and consumption both go down. Right, right. So that's, uh, you know, and these lower prices, uh, I think it's, it is important to understand that historically, when the price of oil fell, it was clearly a net positive, uh, positive to the U.S. economy. But uh, the U.S. is a net oil exporter. It's not an OPEC country, but it is. Uh, and uh, when you when you have a decline in the price of a major export from a country the size of the U.S., uh, that uh, that has an effect on economic activity within the U.S. So some consumers will benefit from lower gasoline prices, but. Uh, Big segments of the American industry will suffer, so we, we, it's going to affect our, the performance of our economy as well. Uh, so no, far, I don't think it's to me. To me, the, the question is: so we know that as a matter of what do I call it, textbook uh, economics, uh, 
um, that's, you know, uh, uh, smaller demand is going to create a reduction in price and all that. The question, and this is a hard one, is where are we going to go from here? Let's assume, as all the medical people are saying this, it's not going to be resolved right away. It may spread in China and outside of China because the border crossings that have already happened. Uh, you yes, know, you've got a long incubation period, and it's uh, communicable while you're in, asymptomatic. This is, this is a recipe for global involvement. So my question to you, this is a hard one, <clears throat> how are these how are these phenomena going to be affected if, say, this lasts for hmm, 90 days or six months or nine months? Uh, what are we going to see around the world on the same issues? Well, let's take a look at a narrow thing. What happened to aviation over previous outbreaks? Right, We have some data on that. And if you look at the next slide, it shows the impact of uh, outbreaks on aviation. And it, uh, it, and basically what this data is, is uh, something we call RPK, uh, revenue per kilometer, right? And uh, of course, there are lots of other sectors, hotels, tourism, uh, general commerce, shipping, but this, this is an area where we do have some fairly good data on how previous outbreaks affected uh, uh, from what we call revenue per kilometer, which is a kind of proxy measure for what's happening to travel. Okay, and you can see that uh, in the avian flu of 2005 and the uh, avian flu of 2013, its effects were relatively modest. MERS, which was this Middle East uh, uh, disease in 2015, did it hurt uh, revenue. You can see a drop from an index of about, uh, oh, let's say, 95 down to 85. And then SARS. SARS was actually quite devastating. It dropped revenue nearly in half, right, within three months. And you didn't get back to where you were to almost eight or nine months later. Mm -hmm. So that was in 2003. So um, I think that... I'm not saying that's the, the outcome we're going to see here. We just don't know yet. Don't know yet. But I think this does tell us that we could be in for a very rough ride. Uh, companies and, and businesses which are, you know, have, have some cash stashed away. They're in a position to make the right adjustments. We'll be able to survive this. I don't know if you saw an announcement by Cafe Pacific this morning they have announced to all the staff that they should plan on taking up to 90 days of leave without pay over the next six months. So they are really bearing down for a long siege on this thing. Now, well, what they tells you also, I think, is that FA, if, uh, if they paid the staff for this 90-day period without any, any revenue, uh, they would be in deep financial trouble. Uh, and that's a phenomenon yeah. I think we're going to see. Some of these companies that are dependent on travel, tourism, uh, transportation, are really have to do something because otherwise uh, they're going to be belly up. Um, and, and that's a great concern globally, don't you think? I think it's a very big concern because if you start uh, laying off a lot of people without pay, uh, you're going to begin to shift expectations on, cons uh, on consumer behavior, going to affect investment. So it is in the interest of all the major industrial economies of the world, including the Chinese and our Asian, uh, large Asian and growing economies, to get a handle on this as soon as possible. Right? We need to figure out how to get this under control quickly. And in this sense, the Chinese, with their somewhat autocratic system, may be doing a good job eventually because they have the ability to order around people much more than we do. Well, I was impressed with the Chinese because uh, very early in the game, uh, they sent a bunch of scientists out to, to uh, identify to, to, to uh, identify the genome, and uh, they did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they, they sent the genome all around the world for other scientists. Uh, so looking at how it could be treated and uh, and create vaccines. So that was, yeah, yeah. that was a good move, and hopefully there'll be more moves like that. Yeah. 
And you might take a look here also at this last slide there, how, how the coronavirus can affect commodity markets generally. These are two uh, graphs here. One is uh, the price of crude oil, and the other is the price of copper. And you can see here that uh, it's, it's been, you know, you're, you're seeing a rather dramatic drop in both the price of crude oil and the price of a major industrial commodity called, called copper. And uh, yeah, this makes these uh, commodities cheaper, but these are not cheaper through technological advances. This uh, is strictly supply and demand. This is strictly the, the demand for these major inputs into the performance of modern economies is just dropping like a stone. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it uh, should be a warning to the Trump administration, to the Congress, to all the major sort of economic leaders around the world that they need to get their hands around this as soon as possible. Yeah, and that puts a, a serious burden on the U.S. because we do have the medical and research facilities. Exactly. Yeah. We have to take advantage of them. But, you know, one thing, um, and it's just all sort of in between the points you've talked about is is that this affects people's um, sort of a socio psychosocial sociological effect in the world, um, and uh, and I think that when you have um, a very threatening thing like this, and then you see the result of that threat actually play out, people get down on things. They're unhappy. They don't see a good future. Uh, they worry. And when that happens, uh, you know, uh, entrepreneurship and and innovation slow down too. Um, and I think that it's a real threat to the world to have a serious epidemic like this, uh, where there is no light at the end of the tunnel. So that's you know, the solution to put the end. I'm sure, right, and I'm sure this is a heretical statement, and I, but I'm going to make it anyway. You cannot put all your brain power in one area. We cannot put all our brain power on climate, okay? We need to put some brain power on climate, a lot. But we can't put all of it into climate. We have to let this brain power get into other sectors, in the medical area, in basic research and everything. So, and my observation has been in the last couple of years is that it's very tough. You know, I, I was at a bar in Honolulu recently, and I met a young man who was a brilliant researcher working at the uh, teaching at UH and he was involved in finding offshore groundwater and I said well that's fantastic he says you don't understand there's almost no interest in it there's no money in it there's no research support for it because if you're not working on climate all the foundations all the government agencies are not interested and so I do think that uh, we need to sort of think about this very carefully. How do we allocate our resources for brain power? You know, because we need people to work on things other than climate. We need people to work on climate, but we need them to work on other things as well. So that's my little uh, kind of hobby horse for today. So at the end of the tunnel, <laughs> when we come out the other side, Lou, how is this process you know, the, 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 the epidemic, the, uh, the threat, uh, the psychosocial reaction to it, the economic reaction to it, going to affect the energy markets on a longer term basis. Uh, certainly, well, I, actually, I, I, I think if this is a one off thing, if this is a one off thing. I don't think, uh, look, people like to travel. People are getting richer. They like to go see places. And uh, once I believe that, as in the past, as the, as the data showed on revenue per kilometer, once they get this under control and everybody gets comfortable that it's safe, that uh, there's a vaccine for it, um, I, I think we're going to go back to, uh, you know, the ex ante world in which there's a you know, world travel will continue to grow, tourism will continue to grow. So the real... The real role for governments now is to get a lot of smart people to cooperate with each other and to get the research underway, understand the basic fundamentals of this disease, and, and both get a vaccine 
and then learn how to get it in control as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. And as for the rest of us, we have to watch this carefully, even if we don't yeah. do medical research or support it. You know, exactly. Right. Exactly. We have to be informed about it, and we have to watch the markets for that matter. And one guy uh, told me this week, he thought this was in, in a, a strange, bizarre way, it was an opportunity. Because whenever he saw some kind of problem in the market, uh, you know, that results from this sort of uh, epidemic, um, he would identify the stock and buy it, which I thought was yeah. slightly bizarre. Well, that might be, so for individual investors or, you know, hedge fund managers, okay, because they can make some money. And that's part of the uh, nature of markets to move cash where it's needed. But that's separate from the public policy point of view, which is what is the responsibility of governments? And if, you, if you're looking for an area where there really is a consensus that the government has a very important role, it's public health, right? It's public health, it's epidemics, it's vaccines. This is an area where the government should be, should be well equipped and able to do a good job. And I was impressed with the HHS leadership team that held the press conference, you know, Fauci and all the guys from CDC, we do have some good people working on this here. I'm concerned we don't have enough, but at the top, I was very impressed. These guys were on top of it. They had a lot of good ideas and you had no doubt that they were gonna go work in, they were gonna put the, a maximum effort to bring this under control. You had the same reaction. And, and taking from what you said a minute ago, and I think one point is very clear. And, and we live in a complex world, an interconnected Thomas Friedman kind of world, a flat world, if you will. Yeah. Uh, and we and we, we really do, do depend on China and so many other places for, you know, a, a balance, a, a global balance. I mean, we're all in this together, one big global family. And exactly, that, that exactly. an individual person has very little effect on it. Governments have more effect. The government of the United States has more effect. And so we... If even if you thought we should reduce the size of government, reduce the initiatives by government, this is a reminder that, that only government can solve this problem. There's no white knight coming out of left field on this. Government. No, this, this is a role for government. This is a great, this is an appropriate role for government, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, government does a lot of silly things. This is the area where we should be having the plenty of resources and plenty of brain power. So drilling down one last question, Lou. Sure. You're in, you're in uh, Japan. Um, you, you made the trip. There's you know, a certain amount of risk in all of Asia, but you made the trip. And you're uh, presumably at a conference or uh, some sort of uh, you know, energy event. Um, right. how, how do you feel about this you know, from that perspective, being there? making the trip, uh, following what's going on, looking at the markets. Are you optimistic or pessimistic? For the no, I'm, I'm, my problem is I'm by nature an optimist. Right? So, uh, so I, I am optimistic. I, I think uh, the more people I meet, the more people I see in all these different industries and sectors, there's a, there's a lot of people, you know, trying to do the right thing, uh, making things happen. Uh, you look at Japan as a very easy place to visit. People are, a lot of people are wearing masks. Uh, it's extremely uh, clean environment. It has, a, uh, I think it's, it's in size of its vulnerable population is very low. I mean, it's got good medical care. So I'm not, if you're asking from a personal point of view, I don't feel at risk coming to Japan. Well, um, thank you, Lou. Yeah. It's great to talk to you. Are you gonna be coming back the next couple of weeks? I go home on Saturday. And we can talk two weeks from then, from now. And I we look can, we can. Hearing about your trip and uh, about what happens in the interim, yeah. Yeah, and hopefully this problem will be fixed by then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Okay, thank you, Jay Aloha. And sayonara. <laughs> yeah, sayonara. <laughs>